Hey guys, Smudgy from Red Court Apparel. Today we have John in talking about complex attack in Kabul. My name is John Smith, um, former British military, member of the 2nd Battalion Royal Green Jackets and 4 Rifles, and uh, my later career was as a security contractor in Afghanistan. Uh, predominantly working in Helmand Province and Kabul. Uh, so I deployed to Afghanistan in 2010. I worked in Helmand Province up to 2013, and then from 2013 to 2019, I was working in Kabul. So the situation in Kabul, while the time I was working there, it, it varied from 2013. Um, up until then, I never thought Kabul was a dangerous place. Uh, I'd heard stories of contractors working out there, going to restaurants, um, people going out to bars. It seemed like a place where there was no threat. Uh, however, from 2013 onwards, there was a huge change, a huge change in dynamics to what the enemy forces, the Taliban, were doing, and then later ISIS. For me personally, it started to change in January 2013. Major attack uh, happened that I was involved in. And then predominantly throughout the years, up until 2019, there was attacks every couple of months on coalition forces and security contractors, and also the Afghan population themselves. Uh, these were conducted via um, the Taliban forces uh, to disrupt uh, the government and just to cause disruption to ISAF and try and get them out of the country. Prior to the attack on our camp, um, which is in 2019, we had a vehicle call sign, leave the base, and it was hit with a VBIED. Uh, what this did though, it indicated to us that the Taliban uh, or ISIS were willing to attack us at our camp location, and previously we'd felt quite secure uh, there. We have external security on the base, run by local nationals and Nepalese guards, uh, so we always felt qu quite secure inside. Um, we did man our own cure. Uh, on the night we're going to talk about, I was the QRF commander. Uh, but that small incident with the lads getting hit outside uh, just led us to believe something now is going to happen further. Well, prior to the night of the attack, which was the 28th of November, um, we, had previous, we had intel come in from local source that there was potentially going to be an attack on the camp. Uh, how did we deal with that? Um, our QRF stood up as a 24-hour uh, stand to QRF so we always had four guys ready to deploy to the breach if there was a breach and deal with the threat the rest of the teams then filled in that QRF with regular uh, regular stand to um, Taskins so if there was an attack at any time then the lads could deploy straight away and there was no lull at all um, this went on for about a week uh, with no attack came so all the QRFs were stood down to the normal five minutes notice to move. And every, all the regular teams just went on about normal taskings. Now the camp we live in um, is 100 plus guys. Um, that's not all contractors. That is, we got local Afghans providing security, Nepalese forces providing security, uh, our own security teams, and then guests who are living inside the camp along with the management side who live there and run the contracts for us. So the morning of the attack, um, it was just a regular day to be fair. Um, I was QRF commander, came up, got the guys awake. Um, we had a little brief on the threat update, what had come in the night before. And just brief guys, let, them know, let me know if you're gonna go to the gym, go to the gym and all your QRF kit, make sure you take it with you, make sure your radio's on, make sure your phones are on if you're gonna go to the gym. Uh, the guys are on QRF routine for over a week, so we still like to stay fit and the guys just train in what they're wearing that day. Uh, most of the guys just went to gym that day. I myself went to gym, and normally just sitting in your room, just waiting for the go call. Uh, our taskings are anything from responding to a VBIED or a, a call sign in distress, or an uh, incident on camp. It could be a medical emergency where someone being taken ill, taken to the hospital, or some sort of camp attack, an attack on the camp we have to deal with. So, leading up to the evening, pretty normal. Put me washing in. Uh, 
the guys who I train with do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and submission grappling. Um, we had all our training gear in the inside the washing facility. So, you know, my plan was go and eat my evening meal with the lads, um, then go over to the washing, pick up all our training gear, and then head back to the evening brief, and then we'll train for the night. That's pretty much normal routine that we do. So sitting in the scoff house with my team, um, we all sit on the top table. It's a um, everyone know everyone everyone calls it the top table. The same guys sit there all the time. It's all the lads who train with me. Um, it's not our table, but everyone seems to think it is. No one else sits there, so we're all sitting together. Um, we ate our meal, and me and Jace were lumbered with it going to collect the training gear from the from the washing facility. So me and Jace left the cookhouse. We walked over about 20 meters to the washing facility, picked up all our gear, and then as we're walking out, the whole world just erupted inside the camp. So as I'm walking out of the washing facility with all the training gear, uh, pitch black at this time, uh, there was a fog in the air, and it was pretty weird. Uh, we hadn't had any fog um, of an evening at all, so visibility was really poor. Um, myself and Jace walked out, and we did, we did mention, we just mentioned it, how, how black it was. And just as we're talking, there was this huge flash that just went off. Um, I felt a blast, concussion hit me, um, seen a flash in my eye, and I was blown back inside the building. I remember being on the floor and all the roof was on top of me and I was sort of scrambling to get up. I knew there was an attack. My initial thoughts were uh, this is an IDF attack and a rocket had just landed. I'd been in rocket attacks before in the military so I just assumed it was that because the flash was so close to me. I then thought about Jace. Uh, is Jace okay? I literally got up uh, with the aid of some Afghans who work in the washing facility. I checked myself over to make sure I wasn't a casualty and I was fine. Uh, my pistol was on my side, but I'd lost my radio. I didn't want to wait around looking for the radio. Um, I was the QRF commander, but I knew I could get one off my team. So I left the radio behind and went out looking for Jace. Uh, Jace was nowhere to be found. Uh, I thought he may be a casualty and maybe in, in the side of a building somewhere. So I checked around the side of the buildings, uh, but I couldn't see him. Uh, due to all the smoke now, from the blast, uh, I had to use my phone torch to look for him. Uh, I did not want to leave him behind in case he was a Kaz, uh, but I searched the immediate area and realized he wasn't there. And my thought process was he's moved back prior to the plan, gone back to his room to get his kit and equipment. Well, after realizing Jace wasn't there, he wasn't a casualty, and realizing that he's probably gone back to his room to get his gear, um, I knew, right, my job now is, as the QRF commander, I'm going to be dealing with uh, the after action of what I thought was a rocket attack. So looking for casualties and a clearance of ordnance. That was my initial thought. I couldn't hear any firing. There was no gunfire going off and there was no secondaries going off. Um, I did look around and the place was a mess. Um, the buildings we live in are all prefab, so they were all all, all twisted up, bits of metal and plastic all twisted up everywhere. And I just thought, wow, that was, that was a big rocket that landed. Um, so I then moved back to my room. I picked up my body armor, got me, got me battle belt on. Um, I didn't have a radio, but put my helmet on, grabbing grab bag, made ready on my weapons and moved out of my room into our sort of main corridor where all the lads live. Uh, to meet up and meet up with all the lads. Our sort of SOP would be to meet up there as an RV point and then issue out tasks to certain people. So after grabbing all my gear and moving to our first RV point where I meet all the team, um, I came outside and it was still pitch black. The alarm was going off. Uh, however, normally the backup generator would have kicked in. Uh, the problem we had was the backup generator didn't work and the blast has destroyed the, ma the main generator. Uh, so it was pitch black. Um, obviously, when we do any sort of training for this, we do it in the daytime, we do it at night, but we use the backup generators to, to light up the camp so we can see. But I, I found it very strange there was no lights on. 
Um, so when I mess up with the guys, still pretty dark. Um, guys were putting on the red lights just to make sure, you know, we could highlight who we were. Um, we were still in sort of a safe location um, in regards to the blast. Uh, we're at the back end of camp. Um, I did a quick head check of my QRF team. Uh, it's meant to be four of us, but only counted, including me, three in total. So we were missing one guy. Um, now, we, that guy could have been anywhere. Um, I didn't have the time to wait for him. Um, so what I did, I moved my QRF team up to the RV point. Um, it's in the centre of camp. It's where we all meet up and then the teams can carry out uh, security and search teams can move out or a breach team can move out towards a breach if there is a breach. So I arrived at the RV point. Um, I went into the centre. One of the, the other commanders came in with me, uh, Nick. He was my team leader and he was then IC of inner security. Also one of the security managers came in and but it was quite funny because he came in, he was in his shorts and his t-shirt was flip-flops, he had no gear on. Um, I have a bit of a legend actually, um, because I told him, look, one of my guys is missing and he immediately grabbed the LMG uh, off one of my uh, lads uh, because he carried his LMG and he carried his rifle. And he's like, right, I'll be your fourth man. <laughs> it was great because I was like, look mate, I really appreciate you so much. Thank you, but we're all right. You're not dressed and you've got a bigger role to play here. We need you to be commanding everybody. Um, uh, but I just thought it was excellent that he was willing to, you know, suit up even without any armor on, no helmet on, and gr grab a weapon and jump in with the lads and get dirty. Uh, it was great to see. Uh, but we sort of stood him down and we had a little chat. And again, my immediate thoughts were it was an IDF. When I looked around, it's pitch black. Uh, the smoke was so heavy now, and it was mixed in with all that mist and sort of fog. Uh, visibility was probably about 10 meters here. Uh, it was awful, and we don't carry night vision. Um, so again, we're gonna have to do this at night. We're out of backup power supply because it wasn't, it, it hadn't come on, and without any sort of NOG capability. So the task now is just harder itself just by the natural elements of the dark, the mist, the fog, now with this added smoke in the air, it was just hanging in the air, it was extremely heavy. Um, at this stage then, we're discussing what we're going to do, and then what turned the whole thing for us was the gunfire. Um, AK-47 gunfire going off at a rapid rate. I looked at the other commander, Nick, and said, right, this is a camp attack, this is a breach, it's an IED and the whole thing changed now the dynamics of our job had changed because in my head i thought it was going to be a clearance operation now it wasn't it was now a breach operation we were now going to be pushing forward uh, as a small team to engage taliban fighters So on initially hearing the gunfire, um, it was full auto. Uh, obviously it's extremely loud because of the environment that I live in, it's all close knit and close quarters. So that all them sounds just echo around each little building. Um, we started hearing grenades going off. So we knew, and the MO of the Taliban being a suicide squad. Um, again, we didn't know numbers at this time, but I could hear multiple weapons going off, so it was, it was more than two. Initially, we thought it was going to be more than two. So I looked around again, I grabbed my team, and I just said to them, are you ready to go? And the two lads both looked at me, nodded and went, let's do it. Uh, that just gave me the buzz. I was just like, this is great. Um, I've got two guys who are willing to you know, push forward into the breach and fight these guys. Um, our role now 
was to protect everybody else in camp. Um, I needed to create time. That's what I needed to create. If I can push forward, it gives people time to get themselves ready. Now, a lot of the lads would have been in a gym kit. A lot of the lads were, or it, were just eating scoff in the shorts, you know. Um, nobody was ready, except obviously the QRF who were good to go. Uh, so we needed to create time. And that was my sole aim, was to push forward, create a barrier between them and my teammates so they could get their kit ready. And then we could protect the clients, the management team, and obviously kill all the insurgents. So I left the RV point with my, two, with my three man team in total. Um, I went point, point man. I had my LMG gunner behind me and then a rifleman who was behind him as a three. Uh, single file and we're moving in sort of qu quite close knit urban environments. Now in this camp, the camp's only a few, meters squ few hundred meters square. Um, and I immediately thought, right, the breach would have been at the front gate, so I will move towards the front gate. However, there had been a small amount of time between the blast and me hearing the gunfire. So I changed direction and headed to where the, la where the gunfire was coming from. Um, I'm moving, you know, extremely slow now. Um, I've got the weapon up in the aim. I'm point man. I can hear the AK-47 going off and it's probably about 50 meters away from me. So I'm moving up. Game visibility was extremely poor. I'm only getting about 10 meters vis. Um, the, the smoke from the blast started to come down and settle. And so it, it was just really hard to see. Uh, it was a huge concern for me because what I didn't want to have is a blue on blue. Uh, we got guys going around the running track of an evening could have been disorientated um, and walking towards and running towards me. We have clients could have been in their accommodation running towards me. And then also we have our Nepalese staff, our security there who could have been running. So the dynamic of me pushing forward towards an enemy combatant, um, there's lots of things going on in my head. I didn't want to get engaged with the wrong or engage the wrong person. So being switched on, and making sure you're shooting the right target was, was paramount to me thoughts right now. I did have an indicator where the shots were coming from, and so I started to move forward towards there. So from this position now, um, I'm looking up to make my next move, and my whole world erupted. Um, muzzle flashed straight in front of me, and I could just feel th the rounds coming at me. I took cover behind the wall, and I looked behind me to check the lads were okay, and they were both behind me, good to go. But what we could see on the wall behind us was all the rounds impacting the wall. Uh, these are all prefab metal, so you could see the rounds actually going through the metal, and you could see the, uh, the holes in the metal. Um, I laughed at this point. <laughs> that was highly amusing. Um, I nodded to the guys to have a look behind them. <laughs> One of the lads was like, oh, fuck. He goes, I ain't getting paid enough for this shit. Um, I said, it's too late now. You know, we're in the mix. Let's get it, let's get it on. Um, the fire withered down. I came out, seen the muzzle flash and engaged, and engaged the muzzle flash. I, I couldn't see the enemy fighter at this stage, just, from, just his weapon. So fires a magazine, a clean magazine full at that, at that muzzle flash. Um, once the magazine was, uh, was expended, took cover, did a magazine change. Um, I stopped the team from moving. I said, right, we're going to watch and shoot here uh, before we move off, just to see if uh, any of the enemy had made a movement. We were scanning our arcs and we seen a threat come towards us. Uh, at speed, someone was running towards me now. And I land my weapon onto the target I was about to fire and I give the team check fire, check fire. My LMG gunner was on the floor, he checked fire too. Uh, what it was, it was one of the Nepalese guards had come running at us. Uh, so with seeing that then, it was just, it reinforced that we had to check each person, you know, and had to be 100% who we were firing at, regardless of what was going on around us. Um, again, the last thing we wanted to do was kill anyone we shouldn't. So with that, 
another two people come running at us and again the thought is suicide bomber because we know the mo is uh, insurgents will carry suicide vests and we don't want to get involved in a suicide attack as well so we aligned onto the targets again but i gave the check fire wait 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 again as soon as he got into that 10 meter range that i could see i recognized he was a gurkha um, i was quite happy then with this 10 meters so I thought, suicide bomber, I'm probably going to be okay within 10 metres of a blast. Uh, it, but it was another Nepalese uh, security guard ran past us. So once I heard uh, the AK-47 to my rear, I just thought, no way, I'm surrounded. How have they got around us? Uh, well, understanding the layout of the camp, it was quite easy how they got around me. Um, we had a small perimeter of security uh, around the HQ. And then I'm the only call sign that's pushing out. So I've gone down one corridor and another insur an insurgent's engaged me from 20 meters away. And then one of the other insurgents has gone round to the rear and got round the building behind me. Uh, luckily for me, uh, the team on the inner security had seen him and engaged him. However, in that engagement, uh, I was later to find out one of my teammates was killed. Um, the inner security team had all lined up along the along a wall and they were all protecting the HQ and the staff at the HQ. The insurgent that had got around me had engaged the perimeter team and the perimeter team had retained fire. Uh, however, in that return fire, uh, we lost one of our operators. Uh, the teams themselves, they all closed in on our casualty and extracted our casualty back to the HQ building. Uh, at the time, I didn't know any of this. I was later to find out this um, later on. Uh, but initially then, I thought, right, I'm surrounded. So what I couldn't do, I thought, I cannot now move backwards. I've got to keep pushing forward. Okay, there's no backward movement because the possibility of getting into a blue on blue with my own inner security and now with this insurgent who's to my rear was massive. Uh, so I felt like I was just trapped and stuck between a load of gunfire. Uh, as I'm about to step off from my new line of departure, um, I, see, um, I see movement left to right. So what just happened with the Gurkhas moving towards us, I've now got someone else moving towards us, but there was something different about it. It was slow and more deliberate. However, uh, understanding that people might be uh, dazed and confused, it could have just someone just stumbling and being a bit slower. Uh, so I tracked the movement of the person in front of me from left to right. Uh, as he got within 10 meters of me, I could see it was an insurgent carrying an AK-47. Uh, I lifted up my weapon, put him in my sights and engaged with three rounds. As I've engaged them, um, I got hit. So I'd never been shot before, uh, but I knew I'd been shot. Um, I was shot in the hand. Um, I was holding on to the pistol grip and that was the hand that was hit. It was the right hand. I just felt a weird vibration in my hand. Uh, I took a step back into cover and just called out, right, I've been hit, been hit. Uh, my hand was a mess. Um, my finger was hanging off by skin. I could see the bone exposed. Um, obviously, claret, blood everywhere. Um, and it was literally just like shaking. I had no movement in the hand. Um, it, I, it just felt like I was hit with a baseball bat or something in the hand. It wasn't overly painful. Um, I wasn't in any shock. I just, right, I've been shot. To my immediate thought was, fuck, I've got a holiday booked in three weeks. I'm meant to be going on holiday. Um, and also, I'm meant to be training uh, jujitsu tonight, and that's my good, my best hand for grappling. So I was extremely pissed off that they'd fucked up my grappling night and my holiday. Um, so taking cover then, I, I thought to myself, right, what was a three-man breach team QRF is now a two-man because now we are a casualty um, and I'm a liability moving forward. Uh, we train um, support side shooting all the time. I'm a big advocate of training support side. Uh, so I knew I could still find my weapon. Uh, what I did, I just changed my weapon into my left hand and used my wrist and my forearm uh, as a support. Uh, obviously, my finger hanging down was was a bit of an annoyance at this time. Um, what I needed to do now was inform 
the teams that we had a casualty in the QRF. Uh, I looked to my front again. Uh, I asked the guys who were still covering down, uh, down the sort of lane, have you seen the body? Couldn't see the body of the guy I engaged. Um, he had moved off into another lane, uh, another adjacent corridor between buildings. So I tried to get on the radio again, but still no comms. So what I did was pulled out my phone and decided to use the phone. So it's pitch black right now. And for some reason, I'm not thinking about the light on my phone, but obviously my teammates were because I'm ringing on the phone and my lights lighting us all up in this pitch black dark corridor. And they're like, dude, can you turn your fucking phone off? So uh, a little comic moment that sort of relieved the sort of pressure that we were under. Uh, switch my phone off, uh, put my phone away. So I decided now, right, best course of action would be for me to get into a bit of cover, apply self-help first aid, and then we can try and push on with our task, inform the rest of the lads where we are, that we had the casualty, but we can still fight and we can still move on. Um, I looked behind me, uh, buildings were still all a, were all a mess. However, there was a set of stairs that we could go to a second floor uh, corridor. Uh, this seemed like a good option to me. At least we could then barricade the corridor uh, from the stairs and I could seat myself. So what I did, one of the guys then, he exposed himself to gunfire. He moved up the stairs and he cleared the corridor. Came back outside, let me know, right, corridor's clear, we're good to go. I then moved up the corridor and moved into one of the first rooms. And our LMG gunner, uh, he moved then followed me up and he secured the door. Once I was inside the room uh, is when I sat down and I got my first, uh, first experience of, of shock. I'd never been in shock before. Uh, it was a new experience where I could feel my body uh, reacting to what had happened to it. Uh, head got a little dizzy. Uh, there was a bit of blood loss, not a major out. And, but I could feel myself shake a little bit. Uh, I sat down and picked up the phone. Uh, got through on the phone, I called uh, the team leader who was in charge of the inner security, Nick. Just told Nick, look, been a casualty mate, a man down, uh, been shot in the hand. Uh, we're good to go, uh, but we are now limited to two men and me. Uh, Nick told me, Roger that, um, can you tell me what building you're in? Uh, it's at this stage the shock hit me then. I could not get my head around of what building I was in. And I knew what building I was in. Um, all the buildings are numbered. I just couldn't tell him for some reason my brain uh, wasn't working properly. Uh, again, just the effects of shock. Uh, but I recognised that. I told Nick, look, I think I'm going into shock. I'm going to pass you the phone uh, to one of the other team members. So passed the phone over and I immediately got the phone given back to me. Nick said, he needs to speak to you, not me. So I spoke to Nick, what's up? He said, get him off the phone. Yeah, he sounds like he's in more shock than you are. <laughs> so it was a good little, uh, a good little moment to relieve the, the pressure and it brought me back into the, back into, back into the game. So um, I'm now situated up on the second floor of one of our accommodation buildings. Uh, I've got Paul providing security on one door and Fraser providing security on the other. Uh, I've given myself first aid, uh, so my hand was all wrapped. And I'm now on the phone um, to the team leader, Nick. Nick's told me that they're in contact um, and that I, he needed me to hold my position. Uh, at this time, uh, all I could hear was grenades getting thrown uh, we had a number of grenades thrown at our location. Um, however, Fraser and Paul didn't have a clear shot on anyone, so there was no return fire from us. To be honest, I was, I was happy with that. Uh, what I didn't want was uh, a team trying to breach up the stairs uh, towards us with me being a casualty. I could hear the inner security uh, cordon. I could hear them engaging, so I knew now, again, I knew that they were still engaging with one of the insurgents or one of the insurgents. Um, again, speaking to Nick, he said, right, what we need you to do is hold your position. Okay, you're the only team that's got movement outside the, out, uh, outside the perimeter. 
So we want you to hold and we're going to allow the insurgents to come to us and we'll, we'll clear them that way. And that way then we don't get any blue on blues and we're not causing ourselves uh, any casualties by moving around. So uh, I stayed in contact with Nick uh, on the phone. Nick gave me a new sit rep. He said, right, new course of action will be for you to hold position and a two-man team is going to come and help me secure this position. Uh, again, being two men and, it, and me being injured, it wasn't a strong position to hold. Uh, he told me it was going to be two guys, uh, Dan and Carl. Both of these guys were my best friends. I spent every day hanging out with them, training with them. Uh, I was relieved because of the level of professionalism in both these guys. Uh, and I knew if anyone was going to come, it was going to be them too. Um, what had happened was that on the inner security team, when they took that casualty, they'd extracted the casualty back to be treated by the medic. Unfortunately, uh, casualty didn't make it, and we lost a strong, extremely professional operator named Luke Griffin. Um, however, the fight was still on, and the guys couldn't uh, sit around. Uh, we had me being a casualty, and Dan and Carl took the initiative to leave the security perimeter and push forward to my location. Uh, they went as a two-man, uh, they moved uh, through the tight corridors of the buildings and moved towards uh, my location. Uh, for some reason, I got comms on the radio. Um, it hadn't been working all night, but I got comms on the net uh, from Dan saying, right, we're on our way to you, and we're coming in uh, at one of the entry points. Um, I gave him an indicator uh, of a red light above our uh, doorway. Then I identified that and said, right, that's the position, position we're going to come in. So I informed the two guys uh, to check fire. We've got Dan and Carl coming up. Uh, Dan and Carl moved uh, on their own, came up the stairs, and it was like the, the most relief I've ever had in my life. Uh, seeing these two dudes just put the biggest grin on my face. I, I think I was giggling at the time. Uh, I was in the centre corridor. Uh, the two lads were on the doors, and when they came in, uh, all geared up, it was just a massive relief. My two best mates at him had come to sort of, you know, help me out when I was in me, in me sort of hour of need. Um, out of anyone on the planet, I wouldn't have wanted anyone else come for me except these two dudes. Uh, so it was amazing. Uh, when they got to me, he said, they give me the layout of the new plan. Um, as I mentioned before, we were going to secure this location, fight from it and engage any insurgents who are going to come. There's no other call signs out now. Everyone else had been accounted for. So any movement now was hostile. Uh, Dan took over security on one of the doors. We pulled back the LMG just so we had a bit more freedom of movement with a rifle on the doorway rather than having a heavy LMG. And Carl sort of sat with me in, in a toilet now. So I'm sitting in this broken up toilet. There was there was piss on the floor from a broken toilet. There was water everywhere. And Carl was trying to get me to sit down. I'm like, I don't want to sit down. It's fucking soaking wet. I'd rather stand, dude. And he's like, no, just sit down and relax, you know. You don't want to go into shock. But I didn't want to sit down. Um, for some reason, I had this visual of sitting on a toilet injured, and it just wasn't a cool look. So I was like, no, I'm good to go. I'll stand up. Uh, I want to remain ready. Um, we were still taking intermittent grenade fire. It was at this time now that Dan gave us the message, uh, stand by, stand by. Uh, we had a threat. One of the insurgents was below our building. Uh, Dan had engaged them, and the insurgent had fell um, and behind, a, I think he behind a tree. So we continued to monitor them. However, this guy, he wasn't done yet. Um, he continued to fire, and he continued to throw grenades. Uh, we were later to find out all the insurgents uh, carrying a bag, uh, with all uh, the magazines in, uh, loads of hand grenades and breaching charges. Um, from the positions of where we killed them, um, they were all moving towards our secure uh, breach rooms where guys can go down in the bunker and be safe if there's a breach. Uh, and all the insurgents were working their way there. Uh, luckily for us, we'd killed them prior to getting down there. Uh, the engagements were still going on. Uh, I knew I'd engaged two, uh, 
and Dan had engaged one. So there were still people out there because we could hear the gunfire going off. Uh, we were told now that we would be getting uh, support from uh, Afghan Special Forces and to make sure we do not leave our locations, uh, they will be moving to the camp and moving through the camp to clear uh, the remaining insurgents we hadn't killed. Triple two, highly professional, Afghan Special Forces linked in with NATO Special Forces, cleared the rest of the camp and killed the remaining of the four insurgents uh, of the total five, the fifth one being the suicide bomber uh, who set off the £2,000 at the gate. Once the camp was clear, the SF team up came up to our corridor. Dan did a face-to-face, -face, handover brief, and they gave us an escort back through the camp and around to the rally point. Uh, where the main SF unit were on the entry point, back entry point to the camp. Uh, we patrolled round, in patrol formation, single file with them. Uh, I was then handed over to a medic. However, there's nothing you could do. I'd already given me first aid. Um, it was pretty much now, I was waiting out for transport to get taken to the hospital. Uh, I was lucky, met up with some uh, NATO SF lads. Uh, they took me down to a bunch of brick mill vehicles, uh, brick mill lads, then loaded me up into the Huskies and I was driven to the NATO medical center at the airport. So it was only later, pretty much I think uh, about six months ago now, um, I was informed by one of the team members um, that on live leak, the training video and the reconnaissance video for the camp attack uh, was leaked. Uh, the video itself shows the, the gun team and suicide bomber training uh, for their operation. Uh, what it also shows was a reconnaissance video from inside the camp. Uh, showed uh, foam uh, being walked around the camp and showing the full layout. Obviously, now we understand why they could move so quickly and they could move directly towards our bunker uh, safe locations. Uh, the video is about 28 minutes long. Uh, it's also a martyr video, you know, showing uh, how these guys martyred themselves, uh, engaging hostile forces uh, in Afghanistan. Massive thank you to John for sharing his story today. If you liked this episode, please hit the subscribe button, hit the notification button, and like the video. I was like, Jesus Christ. I turned around and Sandy was in the back of the medic. I was like, are you all right? And he's like, Jesus fucking Christ. And I was like, well, he's a suicide bomber. Well, that's fucking strange. Didn't expect that.